still with us? You still good? Okay, I'm going to go a little Garth Brooks on you here. Um, this is kind of a spontaneous thing because I felt that uh, God wanted me to share this song that I wrote with you. And it's been a long time since I've actually written a song. But God has been touching my heart and bringing me back to my first love. And my first love is Him. How many know what I'm talking about in that? So <clears throat> it's, uh, it's unique because I feel like He's not just doing it for me. He's doing it for all of us. That what used to give you like pleasure in life and just like used to satisfy you is no longer doing that for you. And I, I remember talking to several youth, and they were sharing that with me, like, yeah, I just, I'm not finding any satisfaction in life. And I said, well, could it be that God's showing you that on purpose, that He's showing you that those things were coming first in your life before your relationship with Him? That even though, as it says in Revelations 2, that you were doing the good work, you were part of a ministry, you were doing all that stuff, you somehow kind of lost the fire for the kingdom and for his name. You know what I'm talking about? So let me, uh, let me share this song with you, and then we'll get started. Um, it's going to be a miracle if I can get through my sermon, but uh, praise God. <laughs> Miracles can happen. Gone through the motions so many times Lost my own way when trying to find The way to your heart with all of my work I push even harder trying to earn All that you have is already won And all of the work is already done Just need to surrender the go of control to trust in your goodness and give you it all coming back to my first love coming back to my first love coming back to my first love like the beginning When I pour out my soul Here in your presence You're making me whole Coming back to my first love Coming back to my first love Coming back to my first love Like the beginning Coming back to my first love Coming back 
to my first love I'm coming back to my first love Like the beginning I'm coming back to my first love Coming back to my first love Coming back to my first love Your love never ends <laughs> wow. Well, there it is. There you have it. <laughs> did, that did that bless you? Amen. Well, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I'm in process. Okay, now, now turn to your neighbor, your other neighbor, and tell them you're in process. <laughs> We are all, <clears throat> wow, we're still in process, huh? <laughs> we are all in process, amen? So I, I really believe that God wants to reassure you in His Word today and by His tangible presence that He is for you and not against you, that He has great plans for you, that He has never left you nor will ever leave you or forsake you. And he loves you more than you could possibly imagine, even when you feel like you don't measure up, even though you're not perfect, because there's no perfect people allowed, right? <laughs> He's the only one that's perfect, and God is with you. Amen? So, since we're all in process, I thought it appropriate to title my sermon, Trust the Process. Say, Trust the Process. And we're continuing our sermon series on Philippians with uh, chapter 1, verse 6. And let's read that together. You guys ready? All right. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue His work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And I am certain that God, who began the good work, say good work, within you, will continue His work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns or until we go be with Him in heaven. So what is the good work that God is doing within us? It's not only the moment of salvation when we became new creations, right? When we gave our lives to God, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that any man or woman be in God, he is a new creation. But it is the lifelong transformation power of the Spirit working within you to make you more like Christ, right? To make you more like His Son. But not only that, but it's, it's also that transforming power so that we can accomplish through the Spirit's power the work of the kingdom here on earth. That's what the Lord's prayer was. It was our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, what? On earth as it is in heaven. So how does he do that? He does it through us. He does it through the good work within us. So <clears throat> he does it so that he can change lives. And how my life was changed at a very young age, uh, I've always had religion in my life, being that my family was Catholic, uh, I had grown up in a Catholic school from kindergarten to seventh grade, and so mass was weekly. But my mom, she took me out of Catholic school and put me into a small Christian school due to the fact that the nuns didn't really like the boys at that age. And so, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade boys kind of rambunctious, and, and the nuns had no patience for us at that time. So I was part of that crew. But I wasn't learning the way that I should. I wasn't uh, being nurtured the way that I should. Um, and going along the lines of the nurturing part, my, my mom and my dad, they were divorced. They got divorced when I was eight years old. And as 
amazing as they, they were, both sides of the family, you know, lots of things from their past and from their life contributed to it, and it was unfortunate. But they, the, both sides of the family did such an amazing job um, making sure that us kids didn't really feel the effects of it, you know? And, and so just God bless them for that. And years later, I'll just put, throw this caveat out there, Years later, God brought healing and reconciliation to, to both of them. And, you know, they're both happily married with their spouses, and their life's amazing. And even, even so, my, my mom and my dad are really good friends. Like, it, it's truly amazing what God can do through an unfortunate situation, right? So, I just love my mom, and I love my dad so much. And just to see them to go through what they went through and come out being strong believers in that, uh, so, my mom, she felt the need, you know, as she was going through her struggles, uh, to pull me out of a school where I wasn't being nurtured and put me into an environment, a small Christian school, uh, that I was going to be surrounded by, by education, a Christian education, and be surrounded by pastors and teachers. So, that was kind of like my mentor, like another parent, you know what I mean? <clears throat> so... That church that I had gone through, it was a church, school, they had a youth group there. And I ended up getting saved at 13 years old, coming out of religion where, you know, it was all about jumping through the ritualistic hoops to feel worthy enough, to feel good enough to approach God. And and their message was, you know, God wants a relationship with you. God wants you to know him intimately, and he wants to be your father. You know, I had a father, but he was going to father me in ways that at the time my dad couldn't. And I distinctly remember that season of my life, you know, being that I had developed these trust issues, didn't know it at a young age, and it didn't affect me until I got older, but I had some trust issues, some abandonment issues, and it, and it played out in different, different ways. But God wanted me to know him and have a personal, intimate relationship with him. Um, And I would say out of everything in my life thus far that God has worked with me on, I'd say the number one issue that I've always struggled with is the area of trust, of trusting him completely, right? We can have our, our things that we really do trust him on and yeah, But what about this area, you know? I've asked myself questions like this. Will God come through for me here, right? Is he as good as he says he is? Does he really care about my little problems, or is he just, you know, busy handling the universe and all that kind of stuff? Does he really see me? And why sometimes does it feel like God is holding out on me? Have you ever asked yourself questions like that? (laughs) Have you ever gone through a difficult season like that to where maybe your trust was challenged, right? So we know in the back of our mind, the right thing to do being believers is is we know we ought to trust God with everything through all things, right? But what happens? You know, sometimes life hits you really hard and it rattles your faith a bit and it rocks your trust, and it's, it's less about complete trust and, and more like kind of a cautious optimism. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Just like, yeah, 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 I, I believe you. I believe you, yeah. Trust you a little bit, you know. Just let me see some stuff first. We've all been there. We've all been in that situation. And it's not just new to us in our generation, is it? And all the way back in Genesis, when the enemy challenged Eve and Adam on what God had said. The serpent approached Eve in the garden, and he said, did God really say that you couldn't eat from any of the trees in the garden? And Eve reminded him, no, God said we could eat from any of the trees except from the tree in the middle of the garden. Because if we eat it, or even even touch it, we would die. Right? He's sowing these little seeds of doubt like he always does. Right? So, he says, you won't die, the serpent said to her. God knows, God knows. See, he he throws that, see, that God's holding out on you here. God's keeping something from you. 
God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So the enemy got Eve to believe that God was holding out on them, to doubt that God was good. He does that with us so many times, does he not? So the woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful, that the fruit was delicious. She wanted the wisdom that it would give her. That's the, the lust of the eyes. That's the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. So this dilemma, then, of dependence and independence, trusting and not trusting, is part of our human condition. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Say, thanks be to God <laughs> through Jesus Christ for giving us His grace. Amen. And His supernatural peace, His supernatural power to persevere even in the midst of doubt, even in the midst of, you know, your faith not being as strong. God is patient. God is gracious. God is he knows our human condition. He knows our weaknesses. That's why Jesus Christ had to come. Amen? I am so thankful for Romans 8, 28 through 30, and it says this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, like we just said, the good work within us, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and those he predestined, he called. Here's the process, folks. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. So this is that trusting the process that we're talking about. God is doing a work in you. In you. And it's a good work. So how can we trust the process? And we don't have all the answers when we can't always see. Hold on. Here it is. First point, we have to see the big picture. We have to see the big picture. So when you gave your life to Christ, when someone gives their life to Christ, they're born again of spirit, as Jesus talks about in, in John chapter 3. And before Christ, you were dead in your sins and trespasses, destined for wrath. But because of Jesus, you've been made alive to God and made a citizen of heaven. How many citizens of heaven do we have in the house today? Come on. And when you die here on this physical earth, you go to be with God for all eternity. Nothing separating you. Right? That's the big picture. But not only that, there's another side of the coin of the big picture. And we're part of God's plan of bringing heaven to earth. So we not only have heaven there, we have heaven here. <laughs> That's why the Lord's Prayer says, and we just said it a minute ago, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Now that's a win-win in the trusting His process. Amen? There's other examples throughout Scripture. Joseph. Joseph, who was favored by his father, yet despised by his brothers. He faced adversity both at home and abroad. His dreams of supremacy angered his siblings. When he was really young, his dad made him a really pretty coat, and all the brothers just had rags kind of thing. And he goes out there and be like, look at this coat. It's so amazing. Look at my coat, everybody. <laughs> and I had a dream that you're all, even dad's going to bow down to me one day. You hear that enough, you're like, this little twerp, get him out of my face. So it annoyed them over and over and over again of hearing that. It's like, he's so arrogant. He's not humble at all. They ended up selling him into slavery after throwing him in a well and his whole life was kind of this sequence of, yes, God was with him, and he elevated him no matter what situation he was in, but it took a while. It took a while. Before long, he ended up going into Pharaoh's palace, having a dream and interpreting Pharaoh's dream, and Pharaoh gave him a job, and that was your second in command next to me out of this whole kingdom because he helped the whole nation through a famine. 
So talk about facing adversity and persevering through it, and then seeing the big picture in the process, right? This is what he says to his brothers when they finally came and like asked for food and he was in charge of all of it. Genesis 45 through 7 through 8. It says, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, watch this, it was not you who sent me here, but God. In the words of Pastor John, there's pretty big butts in the Bible. <laughs> that didn't go over well. <laughs> Sorry. I was expecting a standing ovation. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome, John. I know he's watching. He's like, ooh. <laughs> Moses, another example in the Bible, was in line to become the next pharaoh. You know, remember, the, the, everyone's seen the uh, Prince of Egypt cartoon movie back in the day? His mom puts him down the river in a, in a basket. The princess, uh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, finds him, makes him her own, and, and all that. So he's in line to be the next Pharaoh. Well, let's read Hebrews eleven twenty four. what Moses did. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. There's that big picture thing. He was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the, hand of the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. So we have to do that ourselves. But here's the challenge sometimes. Like Joseph, he didn't see the big picture until later on. He had to persevere under those trials. But the beautiful thing about that part of Scripture is, is that the Lord was with him. So often it said, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. That's what kept him going until he was able to see the big picture. God didn't. I'm like, you didn't send me here. They did. But God used you to send me here. So it was God who sent me here so that I could save a nation. And Moses did the same thing. Set a nation free from the bondage of slavery. And also, too, if you read this is a big one, too. If you read in, in, uh, in Exodus about Moses, it was his friendship with God. <laughs> it was friendship with God that sustained him through those 40 years in the wilderness, you know? Running for his life and being a shepherd before, and then God revealed himself to him in a burning bush. There's that intimacy that he had with God. So... We have David, speaking of intimacy with God. David was the greatest king Israel had ever seen. Many of us know the story of how he defeated Goliath, uh, the nine-foot Philistine giant, and brought a great victory uh, to Israel. But before that moment, <clears throat> when he was a young shepherd boy, playing his little guitar on the pasture, herding sheep, God told Samuel to anoint him to be the next king of Israel. I mean, his family didn't even pay attention to him. All the other brothers lined up to be like, hey, look, uh, look at this guy. He works out. He does all this stuff. He's amazing. And then God told him, like, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. It's like, don't you have any other kids? Yeah, there's the little peon David out there herding sheep. He's, he's too busy to come line up and do this. Go get him. <laughs> God's like, that's the one. I was just hanging out with him. That's the one. <laughs> so he anoints him. But did David become king right away? No. It took 15 years from when he was anointed king to when he actually sat on the throne and started ruling. And all that time, he was running for his life from Saul, serving in his temple court, and then Saul tried to throw a spear at him because God had rejected Saul, hiding out in caves, living as a nomad with a bunch of 400 other rejects that happened to be the mighty men that David made into his army. 
He had peer pressure from all sides to take the throne by force, but he didn't. He let God do the work. He let God open up a way for him. And so 15 years. But what kept him to persevere? It was seeing the big picture. I was like, I have an anointing from God. I have a calling from God that Romans 8 says that he'll wait. he's able to work out all things for the good. He's able to work out all things to accomplish his purpose in my life, in your family's life, in this church. So I just want to encourage you with our first point. Trust the process by seeing the big picture. And if you don't see it right away, you will endure. Keep going. Don't quit. How can we trust the process? Brings us to our second point, is that growth takes time. Growth takes time. <clears throat> During the uh, message last week, Pastor Mark touched on this point. Are you, are you guys doing okay? You still with me? Good. He touched on this point, and he said, have you ever had an experience of going through something very difficult and painful, but it resulted in valuable spiritual and emotional or even relational growth? Right? Looking back, you're like, huh, that shaped me into the person I am today. So somehow through it, we came to know God better. We came to know ourselves better, knew others better, and also built stronger relationships. Just like David in those 15 years, he wasn't ready to be king right when he was anointed. God had to work some things in him, do a good work in him so that he was able to handle the mantle of being the king of Israel. Speaking of of, of going through the process, I have a story. I used to be a service manager uh, at a pretty big pest control company here in San Diego. I was in charge of the hiring. I was in charge of firing, the disciplinary action, the, uh, the ordering of product, the ordering of all the equipment, maintaining the culture, keeping the energy up, and meeting all the customers' numbers. So like, if there was somebody that called out sick, I had to jump in the truck and make it happen, you know? So I was stressed out all the time. Was you know when you have anxiety and you're constantly like this? You're like constantly an inhale? That's how I was all the time. My blood pressure was just through the roof. But I wanted to quit <laughs> so many times. Like, God, I don't think this is the job you want for me here. I don't, I don't think so. But I'd call, I'd complain to my wife, and she'd be like, mm, Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> I'd be on the phone with Pastor John multiple times, like, and he said, and he did. <laughs> and he's like, the Lord's training you for ministry. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not what I want to hear. <laughs> but I will say that it was a lot of really fun moments. God in the details, like we were talking about last week. You know, as stressful as it was, there was a lot of fun. I had opportunities to meet some really great people. And it's funny, when you're in the position that God has you, even like your dumb mistakes end up working out in favor, you know? Like, I don't know. Even, even if I have an example, I just remember feeling like, what the heck am I doing? And why are these guys following me? I got 30-something employees being like, you're the best boss I've ever had. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but after a long meeting one morning, I, I remember somebody coming to my office and was like, hey, uh, Josh, can I talk to you for a second? And I'm like, sure. Yeah, what's going on, bud? And I'm like, just typing away. And he'd pour out his life story to me and say, hey, I know you're a pastor and everything, but could you pray for me? And I've had so many opportunities like that. While God was working maturity and character in me, you know, these little, these little moments where I could be used by him to speak into somebody else's life. So, I couldn't microwave character. I couldn't let someone else's circus be my circus, so I had to stay focused you know, on, my, on my job. But I couldn't microwave that. I needed to keep the big picture that God was doing something in me. 
and maturing me for ministry, to be able to be used and lead a team. And, it, and it's awesome because the testimony is, is that our branch ended up being like one of the most successful branches in the nation of like 30-something branches across the country. So like, what, you guys have the highest payroll and you have the, you know, like, you're not doing it the way that we want you to do it, but your numbers and your organic growth are just awesome. It's like, that's God because God was with him. <laughs> so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for God's faithfulness that. So growth does take time. It takes time in fitness. It takes time in relationships. It takes time in a particular field. So if you feel like, you know, the process, I'm like, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I feel like I should be. Trust the process. God's doing a work in you, which leads us to our third point is trust in God's timing. Just like growth takes time, we've got to trust in God's timing. So easy, right? <laughs> How many know that God's timing isn't always our timing, right? We want our money and we want it now. <laughs> and God's like, I ain't giving you any more money. Be faithful with what you have now. Ooh, that hurt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's our culture, right? That we want, we have instant gratification right here. We can get whatever we want, whatever we need right here. Amazon, boom, at your door in the afternoon if you have Prime. <laughs> Which is right. <laughs> The other thing that causes us to, to not trust in God's timing is comparison. Or when you look around at everybody that has like the new house, the new car, the nice clothes, they've got their, their, their highlight reel on social media, it's just like they're on another vacation? Like, are you serious? The culture of comparison. It robs you of joy. It robs you, robs you of peace and contentment. It robs you of trusting the process of God's timing. I had to wait for God's timing. Okay, another story. You ready for another story? <laughs> uh, I was mostly single in my teenage years um, most of the time because my girlfriend was my guitar. And, and so... <laughs> But there was this one particular relationship uh, that broke my heart. And for a long time, I know, sad. <laughs> this, what am I doing? I'm all like... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's all like... I'm like this little kid up here. <laughs> So this relationship, I was about 17 years old. She, I, you know, being that my upbringing was, was rough, kind of emotionally damaged, I dumped so much emotional stuff into this relationship, and that girl was like, mm, I don't want any of that. <laughs> but I was hurt by it. And it took me about a year to, to get over that rejection. It took me about a year to get my self-confidence back. I went to counseling, and, you know, it wasn't just about the relationship, but other things started coming out, too, um, that contributed to that. And I remember when it clicked, where in, I was sitting across from the therapist, and it was like, I have been giving this person so much power over my life for no reason at all. Look at me. I'm awesome. This is great. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I am fearfully and definitely wonderfully made. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and I, I remember make, talking to the Lord on the drive back. It might have been on the drive back or just on a different day. I was like, you know what, God? If you want me to be single for the rest of my life, yeah, hold on, I'm getting there. This is about God's timing. I said, if you, if you want me to be single for the rest of my life, I know that you will sustain me. 
and I'll be able to do it. And I'll be able to do it with grace. I'll, I'll have no problem with it. And I kid you not, about a week later, I met Daryl Lee. <laughs> yeah. And you know the stories, like God told me she was going to be the one, you know, like that's the one. I don't, it wasn't words that he had said, but I definitely felt like a cannonball go off in my spirit, like when I saw her. I was like, she's different. What is this antenna doing? Like, uh, you know, I see you. She's three years older than me, and so she would tell her friends when her friends saw me kind of following her. She's like, he's like two. (laughs) <laughs> Speaking of God's timing, it's just three years, folks. Come on. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 29. It says, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't understand how it happens. God working behind the scenes, God doing things in his timing. The earth produces the crops on its own. First a leaf blade uh, pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it. As soon as the grain's ready, you might feel ready, but your circumstances aren't ready yet. Or your circumstances are ripe, but you're not ready yet because God's got to do some stuff in you. That's okay. Trust the process. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God, it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. So what does that scripture tell me? Um, It tells me to be faithful. It tells me to just keep going with what God has called me to do, right? So what is God calling you to do? Like, I don't know yet. Well, I think a good way to, to, if you don't know yet, serve in the meantime. Serve in the meantime. God can't move a parked car (laughs) or turn a parked car, right? So... If you are having trouble figuring out what is God's will for my life, he's just like, just start moving your feet, man. I'm a light unto your path. What do you do on a path? You walk. That came out of nowhere. (laughs) That's the Holy Spirit right there. So, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then we're going to pray. What would happen in your walk or in your life if you lived with the big picture in mind if you if you lived every day knowing that hey I'm going to heaven to be with God cuz be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord but also that while I'm still here I get to bring the kingdom no matter where I go no matter where I'm at no matter what trials I'm facing so what would happen if your li- in your life if you lived that way How would you approach your relationships and every other area of your life if, two things, you gave yourself more grace and you cut yourself some slack and you understood that growth takes time? How would you deal with failure? How would you deal with shortcomings in your life? Yes, we have to repent. You know, we have to turn from sin and wickedness and go to God. That's what it means. But what if we lived with this grace that God gave us? Because it's not by works, Ephesians 2 talks about. It's by His grace. And the works that we come out with in ministry or in life are because He loves us. His love compels us to serve. So, third question. How would your life be different If you learned to trust the process of God's timing. It's a learning process. It's not easy. 
I think our lives would be filled with more power, um, more peace, because you're not in control. We have, when we became believers, we became servants of the Most High, you know? He's in control. He's the one that guides our steps. So if this is speaking to you today, why don't we, why don't we, uh, why don't we pray? Let's close our eyes. <clears throat> Go to the Holy Spirit together. What areas in your life are you not trusting God in? You might be you might have several areas in your life where you are, but maybe there's that eh, little dark part of my life or that, that other area that I've been wounded in that I, I'm I'm not allowing him into. And let the Holy Spirit kind of illuminate that. And if he does, just slip your hand up really quick. Mm, I see your hands. It's good. Lord, we thank you for, for revealing that. Lord, we pray right now in the Holy Spirit that you would begin to work on hearts. See, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Lord, there's many of us in here that, that have a hard time seeing the big picture. We're living in the moment, which is, I guess, not a bad thing because you're a moment-by-moment moment God. But the big picture is really important for us to know so that we can endure under trial and stay thankful and joyful. God, I pray that you would reveal to your people today that growth takes time, that we can't rush the character that you're trying to build within us and so that we can handle the next assignment, what you've called us to do. And Lord, may we always trust in your timing, God, because your timing is the best timing. You cause things to grow in season and in due time. And everyone said, amen. amen. So thank you, guys. Now, we have a few minutes, and I'm not a real Q&A guy, but uh, I know Pastor Mark is. What I would like to do is invite you down uh, for prayer. So if prayer teams, you wouldn't mind coming up and um, just being available for folks to, to pour out their heart, be with them, pray with them. During a pre-service prayer, uh, I had a dream the other night that part of the dream was that there was somebody, this could be a word of knowledge or it could have just been bad pizza, but uh, I had a dream that somebody is having an issue with vertigo. And I, I really feel like God wants to touch you and, and heal you of that today. And if that's you, I would love to pray with you. Um, and speaking of vertigo, we, uh, we were in pre-service prayer, and I shared this word. Just to confirm that I believe that this is God, I shared this word, and a couple of us actually confirmed that it was probably not just physical, but also a spiritual, a spiritual vertigo. Um, can someone that knows what vertigo is <laughs> explain it and what it actually does? Um, do you, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Kristen, actually, come on up here. Yeah, why don't you come on up here? We'll put you on the spot. So, <clears throat> I struggled with vertigo um, about four years ago. It came on really suddenly. Um, it's basically disorientation um, of your neurological system. And so, 
It can come in a lot of different forms, but it is debilitating. Um, it, it is kind of hand in hand with fear and anxiety, and they feed on each other. And then the anxiety gets, or the vertigo gets worse. And um, I actually was mostly bedridden for a few months. And um, the doctors that we saw told me it was forever. I was going to have this forever. Yeah. And um, they, they said, they gave a lot of words, a lot of diagnoses, and everything in me, my spirit said no, mm. that I rejected it. And, and that didn't stop the symptoms, but my family did pray for me repeatedly. <laughs> and I remember one day specifically, my dad was praying for me, and I felt something in my ear pop. And he said, that means you've been healed. And I still didn't see the, the fruit of that. And then I felt God tell me, you need to walk. And I, but I couldn't get out of bed, hardly. And so my husband was deployed, <laughs> and my mom was staying with me because I couldn't get up. So we started walking downstairs, hmm. and then we walked to the mailbox. And then the next day we walked to a stop sign. And then within a few weeks, hmm. I was able to walk half a mile without anyone assisting me. Wow. And while I do sometimes, I do have symptoms when occasionally, God heals in a process sometimes. Process. But we have been mm. given the gift of healing. That's right. We don't have to ask for it or beg for it or approach his throne begging for mercy because we have received it. And every time I have symptoms, I just say no. That's right. And so. That's good. Thank you. Good. All right. So, if you need healing in your body, if you are the one that is having a hard time or struggling with vertigo, come on up. We want to pray with you. And if you need prayer for anything, we're up here to go after it with you. So, why don't we do that today, right? This is, this is the kingdom of heaven come to earth. When Jesus often preached on, you know, healing, when healing was taking place, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, can we do that? And if you have to go, um, thank you so much for joining us today. We love you. We appreciate you coming here. Thanks for watching this online. So, yeah, let's go for it. You're adjourned. If you need prayer, come on up. <laughs> adjourned. Hello.